Miguel, we on? We're on, Brother Goot. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our latest installment of our Let's Talk Leadership series presented by the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, Inc. Uh, for those joining us for the first time, this is a series where we talk to local leaders that are either part of the 100 or friends of the 100 about their leadership journey. And the goal is to help our young people, our high schoolers, our college students, and our young professionals as they embark on their leadership journeys to give them some insight from some of the greatest leaders in our community as we see them. And so we are very happy to have with us today, Mr. Odie Donald. And I am going to give you Odie's introduction and then we're gonna jump into some great questions. Odie's a dynamic brother. Odie Donald II is regarded as a national leader in public administration. Odie serves as the administrator for the Consolidated Government of Augusta, Richmond County. As administrator, Odie oversees the day-to-day -day operations for the Consolidated Government of Georgia's second largest city with a population of more than 200,000, leading more than 3,000 budgeted employees, a more than $15 billion tax digest, while administering a more than $800 million operating and capital improvements budget. Prior to joining Augusta, Donald served as the first, the very first permanent city manager for Georgia's fifth largest city, the city of South Fulton. They had to build it from scratch, folks. Yeah. Under Donald's leadership, South Fulton eliminated a $25 million deficit, doubled revenues, established the first positive fund balance in the city's history, streamlined service delivery, and set the strategic path for the city through robust land use, transportation, and quality of life plans. Donald also served as a state labor administrator for the District of Columbia, where he delivered a long list of accomplishments, which included transforming the public workforce system into a national model, expanding the nation's largest summer youth program, leading an array of public-private partnerships, including the opening of the DC Infrastructure Academy, doubling spending with small business enterprises and awarding millions through microloans and grants to small businesses. Donald's mm -hmm. tenure is nationally recognized for inspiring measurable change in one of the nation's most critical communities. Donald is also an active civic leader serving as president of the National Forum of Black, Administ Black Public Administrators, Metro Atlanta Chapter, and treasurer for Young Government Leaders, Atlanta Chapter. Donald is a proud graduate of Georgia State University, earning a bachelor's degree in history in 2003 and a master's of business administration in 2012. Donald has been recognized as one of the Southeast United States most prominent young professionals, being named 40 Under 40 by Georgia Trend Magazine in 2015. That's where we first met yeah. as a young government, young girl 40 honoree by 2018 Young Government Leaders and the inaugural 40 under 40 class of honorees of Georgia State University in 2018, joining a host of innovators in business, government, politics, and education. Donald also received the John F. Wall Award from the National Association of State Workforce Agencies in 2018 and has been recognized as a regional influencer by Who's Who in Black Atlanta in 2016, 2018, 2019, and 2020. So as you can see, he has a very extensive resume with a lot of uh, bio, with a lot of accomplishments. And he's just a dope brother. I've known Odie for several uh. years. We got to spend some time together. And uh, whenever I call upon him, he answers the call and he's always looking to give back and be supportive of the community. And so we are grateful and thankful for having him here with us today for this discussion. And uh, brother Donald, welcome. And uh, let's talk a little leadership. Yeah, man, excited to be here. Yeah. All right, tell us a little bit about your current role as administrator of Augusta, Richmond County. Sort of what's your story? Yeah, man, so I'm, I'm beyond excited to serve Augusta, Richmond County. Uh, as you mentioned, Georgia's second largest city. Uh, I have a very dynamic group of leaders. Actually, I report to 11 elected officials, which... Uh, is both exciting but can also be challenging uh, as you 
no people are really focused on their districts and really kind of united in making sure that Augusta, Richmond County and that consolidated government goes from being a, a really good and, and fairly well run organization to taking the next steps to world class. And so I'm excited to be the person that they've chosen to lead that organization. And uh, right now we've got some exciting things going. We've passed what I believe might be the most diverse special local option sales tax program, at least in our region, but maybe in the country. I mean, we're looking at doing everything from a new water park to about $25 million in road improvements, redoing, you know, the way drainage is done in East Augusta, which is, you know, one of the most important corridors of the city. And then adding, you know, new quality of life things like the James Brown Arena so that we can attract and kind of take away some of those things that are happening in Atlanta and uh, have them have them done in our city and county. So I'm extremely excited to be there and uh, really, really looking forward to taking Augusta to the next level. Hey, man, watch it. You know, I love concerts now. Don't be taking stuff. From yeah, Atlanta. listen, and we got the <laughs> Masters. I'm hoping to see you there for the Masters, too. Hey, man, I'm there. Uh, say no more. So um, many people may not understand the role of an administrator or a city manager. How does the role of an administrator intersect with a mayor and his or her duties? Yeah, so, you know, that's that's a great question. And, you know, I, I'll be honest, before I got into city management, I really didn't understand it myself. So uh, you have two types of government. You have one that's called a strong mayor form of government or executive. Uh, form of government. And then you have the weak mayor form of government, which is the council manager or commission administrator form. And so most people know about uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser, who I had the pleasure of working for in the District of Columbia, uh, or Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta. Uh, they would both be executives. They're the CEO. It means that they really make all of the executive decisions uh, for the government. Uh, in, in short, they control the money and the people. And so that is where uh, most of the authority lies. In the form of government that I work in, uh, which is the commission administrator form of government, that power is a little bit diluted to where uh, the commission, where the mayor serves as the chair, uh, makes all of the policy and legislative decisions, but they have a professional manager uh, kind of as their executive who runs the day-to-day -day operations. And so I oversee everything from uh, the fire department, planning and zoning, uh, and everything in between parks and recreation and all of those different departments that make the city go. And so uh, I get a chance to basically lead based on their vision. Uh, in effect, the, the people set the tone for government, the commission kind of frames that vision, and then I take those things and, and operate government on their behalf. Okay, sounds good, man. Uh, I'm sure that's a interesting experience. So tell us what a day in the life of Odie Donald is like. Oh man, so it, it is never the same. Uh, you know, you, you kind of start off, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at kind of changing the structure of my office a little bit. Uh, the way I kind of look at it is my biggest job is managing two areas. One is the politics, making sure that our elected officials and their goals are really reached and managed. And then the second piece is making sure that the service delivery is, you know, the best, you know, that our citizens can get for a return on their dollar. And so uh, I usually start my day at around 6.30 in the morning, uh, have my first meeting at 7, uh, and then I go until about 10 at night. I usually stop uh, my normal or formal meetings at about 7 p.m. Uh, and then in the evening, it's just kind of catching up on paperwork and making sure that uh, the things of the day are not left behind. But right now, we're talking about everything from creating a brand new uh, judicial court system in Augusta. Right now, it's a three-county court system. We're actually looking at uh, growing it and having Augusta be either a standalone system are a bi-county system to where one of our partners would lead. And so very big undertaking, you know, we're balancing that with the $250 million splice program where we're doing things that we've likely never done before with the example of the water park. 
but also, you know, doing the traditional things and making sure that not only do people have a place to go, but the roads that they travel, you know, don't have all of the potholes and things that kind of ail our community. So uh, balancing a very diverse uh, uh, group of responsibilities daily. So start early, end late, and then get, get going, you know, the next day all over again. So given the, that mix of responsibilities, dealing with public officials, dealing with delivery services, dealing with making sure that the citizens get what they need to make it from the government, um, you know, how did you end up here? Like when you were in college and you said, hey, man, I want to be a manager of a government when I grow up. Like, how did you end up there? Yes, I would have never, uh, ever guessed that that, that was going to happen. So. You know, I, I play basketball. I mean, you can't tell since you've known me, I've been carrying around this belly kind of looking like a, a African-American Santa Claus. But uh, before <laughs> that, I was a pretty decent athlete and uh, I played in about seven countries as well as I uh, was blessed to, to play here in the U.S. as well. And uh, I actually ended my career. I tore my patella tendon and didn't quite recover the way that uh, I thought I would. And so I was going back to school at Georgia State University, the best university in these here United States. And uh, while there, uh, I got a chance to work in local government for uh, what is, is known as Job Corps. And so I worked at Job Corps, got some quality experience. I was a, ended up becoming a regional manager there and kind of got lucky and got my first, uh, what I say, real job with uh, Fulton County. And so I kind of rose through the ranks there. And uh, I like to tell people I've had every job you can have in local government from being the 6'9 intake specialist and, and I guess uh, administrative personnel from Fulton County to being a program manager, executive director, department head, and now manager um, of government. So I, I kind of lucked into it. Uh, and the, the main thing has just been building relationships and learning how to serve people. You know, I think being able to say yes uh, to the things that our citizens want, even when there are challenges in doing so, and it's helped me kind of rise through the ranks with, with service being at the forefront. So I like to ask this question for our young people that are paying attention, right? Because we often go to college thinking we want to do one thing and we end up somewhere else. And some people think it's a failure if you don't end up where you sort of in the field that you majored in, when you went into government, did you just sort of roll with the punches and then just sort of see where it took you? Or were you very intentional, like after your first or second government job, you're like, okay, ultimately- you know, I think this being is able I to say, say yes to, uh, to the things that our citizens want. So I think it's did you been just a little sort of bit- roll with the- Yeah, I think it's been a little bit of both. Uh, so the the first thing is definitely it was it was lucky that I I got an opportunity in government and so uh, definitely tried to take advantage of my first opportunity but uh, I remember my first day at Fulton County I walked in I met a gentleman Mr Burrell Billingsley he's now uh, passed on but he was a great mentor to me and and I'm not even sure he meant to be but I got to see what what it looked like to see an African American leader. Um, I was blessed to, to have a father who's a, a great leader and a former corporate executive, also a former member of the 100. But Mr. Billingsley was the first person outside of him that I got to see, you know, who was not only an ethical leader, but an example of what I could see myself doing. And so eventually I got a chance to have the same role that he had. But I remember just seeing him the first day, meeting him understanding how he oversaw our programming and how he put people first. And, and he was kind of the blueprint uh, for me in government and what type of leader I wanted to be. And from that point, uh, I've always kind of identified, you know, who I would like to be like or what type of leader I would like to be by having some of these strong examples in the community. And so uh, he was probably the first, but after you know, kind of accidentally rolling with the punches, as you would say, getting in the government is definitely been intentional since then. And I've leveraged mentors and great examples, you know, of, of how to, to move forward in my career. So with mentors, that's a good point. Like, who do you, you, you mentioned Mr. Billingsley, you mentioned your father, 
Were there yeah. any other mentors that played a very strong role in sort of your career trajectory? And if so, how did you get the most out of those mentoring relationships? I'd like to share that right. with our young people on how you maximize those mentoring relationships. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely been a, a variety of people, even peers. I mean, listen, we, we've had talks. I, I kind of watch some of the decision making and things that you do and leverage those to kind of help, you know, balance how I make decisions as well. I, I was blessed uh, before he passed. Uh, my father and Maynard Jackson were uh, very good friends. I had an opportunity to interview him for a, a, a college project as well as kind of check in with him from time to time after I graduated and get insights there. Uh, same thing. I actually had a, a few interactions with Andrew Young, who I thought was, you know, a great one. Uh, I'd, I'd say uh, Mr. Billingsley, Stanley Hudson, also of Fulton County was a great one. Uh, Chris Carr, um, our current attorney general, you know, I think, you know, in certain areas, we've got different perspectives on things. But when it came to uh, government service, economic development, and really just the framework of, of how our constitution works. While, you know, he was a, a less engaged mentor and some of those other ones that I had more personal relationships with, you know, that relationship was very helpful. Mayor Bowser, I think I always give her tremendous props for kind of taking me under her wing and really focusing on how we deliver for the people within the constraints of government. So there've been a lot of mentors. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Mayor William Bill Edwards, you know, in uh, the city of South Fulton. So the way I maximized it though, is to take, you know, the experiences, whether they've been in depth or if they've been a broader, you know, experience from a periphery of just uh, observing, you know, how people operate or if it's been some some more uh, structured mentorships, whether it's meetings, advice, and things of that nature, to really help it frame my own uh, path and, and vision for leadership. I think mentorship is great, and building those relationships and leveraging them to, to move ahead is, is good, but more so kind of understanding how other people operate to determine where you sit in the world and in your community and determining how you want to impact it. So I think I think I view it as mentorship in that way to kind of frame how I look at things and what I want to accomplish and then setting benchmarks. I think that's that's been the most beneficial thing in, in the journey of having and leveraging mentors. So you mentioned some really busy and sort of high profile mentors. Yeah as well as others, how did you, you know, for, for some of our young people that may say, oh, well, you know, Odie Donald is running the city of Augusta. He won't have time for me to mentor me. What do you think you were able to do to get those people to connect with you and invest in you? And what did you put into the mentoring relationship to make them keep coming back to mentor you as well? I think the first thing is I asked, you know, I think you're right. People always feel like you're too busy or you know, you've got a bunch of different things going on and you, you won't be able to help. Not true. You know, I, I think I've definitely made it a point to when people call, I answer um, because, you know, you're, uh, you're not a leader until you create a leader who creates other leaders. And that's just a part of, of the leadership uh, spectrum is to have a tree. You know, you, you can only, only have that tree if it bears fruit and you've got to invest in people. So the first thing I did is I asked, but I think uh, my father, who, who is probably the greatest and most important mentor that I've ever had, one of the things that he taught me, you know, is networking isn't just meeting people and telling them what you need from them. If you can't bring anything to the table or add value to a relationship, it's not a relationship. You know, you're just somebody with your hand out. And so uh, when I approach mentorship, you know, I, I'll use uh, Mr. Billingsley, for example, you know, I looked at different issues that were going on within our division of Fulton County and offer, you know, my expertise or at least my willingness to find ways to fix them. And so he was willing to give me an opportunity, but I had to ask and then I came, you know, with something that I think he found interesting. You always start with what you can bring to the table and then you expect people to give you that chance. It's, you know, I've heard no I probably tried, I won't mention all of the people that I've asked to be mentors who've actually said no. 
And so I'm not really as concerned with the no as much I, as I am with the yes. And I can't get the yes unless I ask. And I think that boldness is a very big thing for young people to understand. And, and even older professionals, I mean, you know, you're never too old to have a mentor. And so I, I think that's a, another lesson that I've learned along the way. Hey, man, all it takes is one yes. You can get all the no's in the world, but if you get the right yes, that's all it takes, man. Yeah, absolutely. So you were the first permanent city manager for the city of South Fulton, which was built from scratch, brick by brick. What was it like leading a brand new city that needed to establish city services like police, fire, and even a city hall? So I'll tell you, uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, it was fun, uh, but but I'll tell you that the challenges in South Fulton are probably, you know, everybody says every place is unique and everything is different, um, but South Fulton is really like no other place in the world. I mean, if you think about it, there are 92% uh, of the residents are African-American. It is an African-American-led government with every council member and uh, while I was there, every member of the executive team uh, was a person of color. And so that's just a very unique experiment, but it also adds a lot of pressure. There's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, skepticism and stereotypes when it comes to African-American leadership. And so I think we did a good job of, of kind of overcoming some of those stigmas and really showing what world-class leadership and world-class service looks like, but really building the plane as you fly it. You know, we had a very engaged population there, uh, over 100,000 people. I think when a new census comes out, it'll be closer to 120,000 people than it will be of 100,000 people. And so a quality tax base that hadn't received quality services in a long time, and they didn't want to wait until we were five or 10 years down the line to see that level of excellence. So uh, we had to do everything from create every single law, you know, having absolutely no laws on the books. We had to create a brand new municipal code. We had to develop 11 new departments, uh, a municipal court system so that uh, our residents could be, you know, seen before a judge and jury of their peers. Uh, it was it was definitely a challenge, but I think more than a challenge, it was a great opportunity because I've never been a part of something that was fully created by the people and, and kind of owned and operated by the people. So the thought and concept of South Fulton was created by its residents. The structure was was kind of, you know, bought into and, and kind of identified by the residents. And then the level of expectations and service was also, you know, determined by the residents. And that is that is the way government is supposed to work. And I, I was definitely excited to be a part of it. And, you know, sometimes I, I look back and, and, and wish I was still a part of it because it's just such a special place. It always, always holds a special place in my heart and uh, in my professional journey. What are you most proud of of your time there? I think we actually we we accomplished what what the residents set out to do. You know, it was uh, based on self determination. You know, folks wanted to have a bigger say in their tax dollars. Uh, they wanted to really have a high level of government, uh, and they wanted to see African American leadership and, and it be on a a, a national level. I, I think you know me being selected uh, for Augusta is actually a testament to South Fulton. Uh, the second oldest government in the state of Georgia, which is one of the oldest states in the union, said we want to select someone from the newest city, you know, in the state to come and run our organization. I mean, South Fulton was run pretty well. You know, I think we didn't have residential tax hikes during my time. Uh, we increased our budget. I mean, we had a 70 percent increase in our revenues without raising taxes. That's a big deal. You know, you're yeah. really talking about the quality of services that our residents had. And I think national rankings, when you talk about our responsiveness, uh, there are uh, 159 counties, 598 cities in the state of Georgia. And we were one of only about 25 
that have a current strategic plan. So the vision for the city will outlive me and even those electors that are there. And that's something I'm excited about. Super cool. So we know that the staff is pivotal to sort of the operations of a government, the professionals yeah. behind yeah. the scenes that help run it and bring it all together. What's the most important characteristic of a young person that says they want to be a professional in government and leading government? You know, I think the, the willingness to be flexible and be involved in, in everything, you know, while these governments, for the most part, have been here for hundreds of years, you know, things are different every day. You know, uh, I think the other day we had an issue uh, with flooding. I think there was, you know, another issue where, again, with the judicial system splitting uh, and in your normal day to day operations uh, in the midst of a pandemic where, you know, truthfully, we're all just kind of doing the best we can, leveraging sound advice and, and taking calculated risks to continue to deliver service. That takes a, a willingness to be flexible and a team player. And I think if, if we find young people who are just willing to roll up their sleeves and be a part of something great, it will allow them to grow within government. And I, I think, you know, I've been a, a pretty good testament of that. And just about everyone I've known who's been successful in government has that willingness to serve and the ability to be flexible and pitch in and be a team player. Everything else can be taught. So flexibility and being a team player, are those the entry level characteristics? Are there other sort of different characteristics to actually become leader, a leader in government? Yeah, I think when it comes to being a leader, it does take a little bit more, but I do think it's a learned characteristic. So when it, when it comes to actually being a leader in government, one thing is being able to build consensus. And that's a, that's a trait that's not necessarily easy to come by because I don't think everybody has it. You know, one of the lessons that I've, I've learned, uh, I'll use Augusta as, exam, as an example, there are 10 voting commissioners got to be able to get consensus. So you got to be able to count the six. Once you count the six, you've got the will of the commission. And so being able to get six out of 10 people on the same page to make multiple decisions on in Augusta, a weekly basis is something that is very important. So being able to build consensus and get buy-in is a big part of leadership because, uh, and I guess the second part of that is kind of managing up you know, being able to influence those that you report to, no matter, you know, most people look at it as me being the administrator, they would imagine that the buck stops with me, but that's not necessarily true. Again, I've got 11 bosses and 10 of them vote. And so I've got to be able to manage up and help them understand uh, what's important about the decisions that they're making and how none of these decisions are in a vacuum. So I think, you know, being able to manage up and build consensus are very big uh, traits of, of leadership. But I, I think a third uh, very important part of leadership uh, would be, I guess, the, the intestinal fortitude or, or ethical nature of being a leader. You know, I think I, I'll make decisions that could result in my firing. But if I am, you know, focused on that, if I believe that I'm doing what's best for the people and I think that it is an ethical decision, you won't move me off of that. You know, if, if it is ethical and if it's legal, I don't have any problem and we can come to consensus. But once we move away from those those tenants, then I can I will not be moved. And I think as a leader, you have to have to be willing to stand, you know, on on those values that you have and, and not be moved by them, you know? And, and I think the final thing, and I'll close that out is, when it comes to leadership, it's not always about making the right decision. Sometimes you gotta make a decision. You know, a lot of folks kinda, you know, will, will, my father says, him and haw and pontificate, uh, pontificate to the point where they end up doing absolutely nothing. Sometimes you gotta make a decision and see where the chips fall so that you can continue to move forward. So I, I think when it comes to leadership and advice I give to young folks, that's where it starts. Yeah, those are great principles um, to make up a leadership philosophy. And they're consistent with what we've heard throughout this series from multiple leaders talking about you know, integrity and being a team player and being flexible 
and having the courage to actually lead at a certain point. You just got to make a decision and uh, building a consensus as a team player so that people feel like they're part of the, of the discussion. Those are sort of the common themes that you hear out of all of these discussions. You, you mentioned earlier the pandemic. So in this environment with this pandemic, which has dealt a major blow to society as a whole, different businesses, uh, personal lives, people don't really think about the impact of the pandemic on municipalities and governments. So mm -hmm. what are the biggest obstacles that you've had to manage through as a leader of a couple different governmental entities like the city of South Fulton, because you were still there when the pandemic hit. Yeah. So that's yeah. sort of where yeah. the body blow happened, where, you know, people yeah. are really, with what's yeah. going on. and then now do you transition to Augusta, Richmond County, what are some of the obstacles you have to deal with and how have you dealt with them? Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's similar obstacles in each place, but I think the timing has really kind of impacted how we approach the pandemic. In South Fulton, we were actually the first municipality in the state of Georgia who was impacted by the pandemic. That first case was actually at Fulton County Schools at a school within our jurisdiction. And so we had to respond uh, on behalf of, of the county and our residents pretty quickly. Uh, I think the politics plays a really big role. In South Fulton, you know, we're looking at uh, a mostly, uh, I'd say, progressive government, uh, African-American population impacted the most uh, based on the coronavirus pandemic. And then we're very new government. And so we had some tools that actually some of our counterparts don't have. We already had uh, a lot of services being delivered online. Uh, we were in the midst of some renovations that impacted uh, the level of service that we were providing. Uh, and then I think us not being a direct recipient of CARES Act money impacted our level of service uh, for government. But it also forced us to be innovative. So we took permitting online. Uh, our revenues actually increased to where the city uh, at the time that I left had the first positive fund balance, meaning that uh, their rainy day savings account was positive for the first time in the city's history. And we actually rolled over a $20 million fund balance from the year before the pandemic uh, into the, the first fiscal year after the pandemic. So it was an excellent uh, job by our staff members and by our elected leaders. Uh, in Augusta, very different environment, probably a little bit more conservative environment than that of South Fulton. Uh, I think that the perspective of, of our government has been let's ensure that our doors remain open uh, fully so that our residents can really access services not only online with the new offerings that we have, but also being able to come into City Hall and attend. We're actually debating whether we allow people back into the chambers. Uh, I've actually recommended that we don't do that right now, but I think that's also one of the challenges. We've got a very unique community in Augusta, and I think the desires and the level of service is just a little bit different. And the other piece is, is that it's a county organization, a consolidated government. And so you don't just have one single municipality that you have to be concerned about. In our, our situation, we have three. And then when you talk about the judicial system and things of that nature, it actually expands to a three county system. So the decisions that you're making have a much broader impact. So I think those are the challenges. And just what we've done, to be honest, is we start by listening to our residents. What type of services do they need? How can we help them? We just put $6 million on the street to ensure that people are able to get out of the arrears and keep their rent and their mortgages paid, which is you know, probably the largest allocation in the state of Georgia, including our counterparts at Atlanta. So where we direct our funds and our attention uh, based on the pandemic is just a little bit different in every municipality. And so it, it starts with the people and it ends with the people at, at all times. So when the pandemic hit, we had to be flexible, adjust, make some changes to the way we operate. Are there any of those sort of changes that you think will outlast the pandemic? Oh, absolutely. So I think uh, what we're seeing is that there's a different way to work. So uh, people can work from home a, a lot more effectively than we would have thought. I'll tell you, I wasn't a, a huge proponent of working from home and teleworking, but South Fulton definitely exemplified that in some instances you're more productive. So I think we will see 
uh, more people working from home and having these flex schedules. Uh, but I also think another thing is the way we allocate our budgets and how we prepare for a crisis is also something that's different. You know, we've always uh, focused on these AAA bond ratings as uh, the measurement of good government. I think those are important. In Augusta, we've got a double A, and I, I'm hoping that during my tenure, we're able to kind of raise it and improve it. But the bond rating isn't necessarily what's the most important. You know, we also have to look at when you have this rainy day fund, uh, how are you going to use those funds to really give back to your residents and ensure that they get the same level of service no matter what's going on? And how do you make sure that your government is sustainable? So the perspective on how we deliver services, I believe, is forever changed. And the pandemic, you know, is, is the main conduit of that. So let's talk a little bit more about you personally as a leader. Um, what are a couple of the obstacles or what's the biggest obstacle that you have had to overcome in your career in a professional setting and then in a personal setting, if you want to share? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, listen, I'm still fairly young, uh, 42 years old, and every uh, spot that I've been at each time, since I think I was 27 when I had my first uh, executive role. And so I've always been uh, not only the first African-American to hold these roles, but I've also been the, the first or the youngest person ever. In uh, the technical college system of Georgia, I was the youngest director in their history. Uh, same thing for the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Uh, I think I was the, or not I think, I was the first African American to uh, serve in the city manager role and of course the youngest, uh, similarly in the District of Columbia uh, as well. And so I think there have been racial dynamics um, that have impacted, that I've had to kind of overcome. Uh, I think the perspective of expectations for a young leader where many times the folks that I'm managing and directing are, you know, sometimes a decade or two older than I am. And so uh, being able to get that buy-in and earn the respect of my peers and as well as those that, you know, I have to manage and sometimes deliver discipline uh, to has been, been a challenge sometimes, but I think it's also been a, a great opportunity to pave the way for others, you know, right now, uh, I am one of the things I'm most proud of is there are 30 executive level staff members that are part of my leadership tree, and they have produced over 250 other executive leaders. Um, and and that's a that's a big deal, you know, to be able to grow leaders in spite of and uh, I hope to continue that trend, you know, here in Augusta, as well as, you know, throughout wherever my career might take me. Okay. Um. So leadership is, in my view, a willingness to fail publicly, right? The spotlight is on you when you're the leader, you're the one that's out front, you gotta take the shots. Um, it's risky business, especially in government when politics are involved and people yeah. gotta find who they can point the finger at so that they can get reelected. Yeah. Um, so what motivates you to deal with that daily grind of being a leader in the governmental space where you have yeah. to deal with real politics on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think, you know, it kind of all kind of starts with, with my start in government. I was actually, uh, I started in government. I was pursuing services. I had finished playing basketball, uh, had some housing challenges and was trying to navigate government to be able to get access to, to those services. And I was getting a dead end everywhere which is actually how I met a good friend of mine now, Sonia Wilson, uh, as well as Mr. Billingsley, who I, I talked about earlier. And uh, not being able to access services at a time when you need them most is, is one of the most frustrating experiences that I've ever had. And so being on both ends of the coin, some I'll never forget not being able to, to access services and really impact the way I deliver for my family. And so now being on the other side, every decision I make is to ensure that government works for all. And so with that being the basis of, of how I deliver services and make decisions, 
you know, it's, it's always with the people in mind. And that's why I'm always in line with my elected officials. You know, you won't necessarily see my name on a ballot, but I think the people who do put themselves out there and, and put their names out there, you know, are courageous folks who are willing to lay it all on the line for their residents. Well, us being in lockstep with our mission for those residents has always, you know, kind of helped me be courageous, but also partner with those courageous individuals. So it's going to be very rare that you see me out of out of alignment with elected officials because we see and view things the same way. I think South Fulton's a great example of that. You know, it was it wasn't uh, an accepted or or really uh, something that that people jumped on when we talked about shutting down the city and uh, you know adding curfews and doing all of those things to make sure that we were responding to the pandemic. But we had the lowest amount of coronavirus cases, even though our, our medical infrastructure was not as strong uh, as it should have been. You know, our police uh, were safe. So were our firemen. I think, you know, we provided one of the highest levels of government and we're doing the same thing in Augusta. And while I can take some credit for it, it's really because our elected officials, you know, have stepped up and be, been courageous and, and I've been able to do the same. And so I, I think that's just a part of the job. We talked a little bit earlier about your leadership philosophy with, you know, flexibility, team player, uh, being courageous, what and, and, and integrity. What is your North Star when it comes to leading? What is the thing that stands out above everything else and the rest of the stuff falls in line behind it? What's that North Star when it comes to leadership? You know, I, I think it's just do good. Um, the, the entire purpose of government is really to support your community. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could ever work in the private sector. I've never tried. I don't even have a desire really, you know, I've done the public private partnerships and all of those things, but the, the pension of government, even though it is oftentimes been imperfect, the real goal is to provide uh, order and support for communities to grow and for the will of the people to lead that growth. And so I always start with do good and on behalf of your fellow man. And so no matter what decision I'm making, whether it's you know a recommendation to the commission on uh, the pandemic, or if it is you know how we're going to expense our budget from year to year, it's all people focused is we involve people, you know, in that uh, in those decisions in a way that's likely not done in governments outside of my purview. But I, I just I mean, I think it's what I'm based on is ensuring service to people and making servant leadership and people centered decisions as every facet of my life. And so I think it's it's helped in government and, and I'm hoping that uh it continues, you know, wherever life takes me and, and my family. Are there any books that you've read that stand out to you as helping you craft your leadership philosophy? Yeah, you know, uh, there's one book I'm, I actually just put down. It was the Energy Bus. It was a, a pretty good one talking about, you know, how uh, different groups with, with different energies and different perspectives work together. <laughs> Uh, to deliver. It's a, it's a government centered book. So I think that's, that's one. Uh, I am also always focused on uh, improving and enhancing African American leadership. I think, uh, what is Claude's last name? I uh, cannot remember right now, but uh, Black Labor, White Wealth is one that I've looked at. The 48 Laws of Power is one that I just put down. Uh, and I've actually, you know, been reading an array of religious books. You know, I've always studied the Bible, but I've also uh, looked at the Quran recently as well. Uh, and also, of course, in Miracles, uh, which is a book I was listening to some of my old Jay-Z records. And uh, he highlighted that book. So I actually picked it up last night. And so that's one that I'm, I'm looking at now is, is kind of believing in, in the miracles uh, provided by the universe to to be able to deliver uh, on prosperity. So I'm a diverse reader, but uh, I think that's a part of it as well. Yeah. As you sort of look back on your life and reflect on your leadership journey, when were you first thrust into a leadership position and how did it go? 
Oh man, I will tell you, uh, my father, I mean, you, you know, this. most folks, some folks will, some folks won't, but he used to, uh, he was the first, uh, African-American president of Bell South Mobility. Well, and, and direct TV and cable and wireless as well. So he's, he's led a couple of, uh, uh, high profile organizations. And, uh, when he was at Bell South Mobility as, as their president, he, uh, got me a job as the. I think I was the center manager for H.J. Russell's summer program. Uh, and I think I had about five staff members and our campsite or whatnot had about 200 young folks in it. And I. And all of that good stuff probably would not have expected to be the type of leader that I've grown into today. But, you know, I think that was the the failure there. And I actually got fired. So it's tough to get fired from a job that your father gets you when he's <laughs> the, the head on. Hello, everyone. Kevin Gooch here. Thank you for your time today. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the work of the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, Inc. We are a 34-year-old organization that focuses on mentoring and making a difference in the community. We are a volunteer-led member organization with a roster that begins with Hammer and Hank Aaron and ends with Ambassador Young. And we have a lot of legends and titans of industry in between. And the common theme amongst these men is that we all came together to lock arms and truly make a difference to impact our community through mentoring. Because what they see is what they will be. We appreciate all of the support that we've received throughout the years and in 2020. But unfortunately, we've had to cancel three of our biggest fundraisers for the year. That would be our 100 Honors, the Celebration Bowl, and Divots and Divas. And so as an organization, we need your help. We need more help. If you want us to continue to provide the programming that we've been delivering to our young people, if you want us to continue to deliver on that promise that we've made to positively impact the community by making a difference in the lives of the young people in these communities that are often left behind, these vulnerable young people, please, please support our organization. You can go to our website. You can make a donation there. You can connect with our members. You can call our office. And uh, we will be happy to have you uh, in the fold with us, supporting us, investing in us so that we can do the same for the young people that we serve and this community that we serve. Thank you for that. That was a little video that we did towards the end of the year last year uh, to help share the good message and the work that we've been doing as the 100 Black Men of Atlanta, Inc. Uh, we had a very productive 2020 and we're starting off with a very productive 2021. And so if you want to support us and continue uh, to fuel the work that we're doing in the community, please uh, check out our website. There's a donation tab. And um, we need your help. Of course, during the pandemic, we had to cancel fundraisers. And so uh, we're, we're, we're doing the most with uh, the budget that we have and stretching uh, everything that we have to make a difference, but we could also use your help. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. We ran our uh, our video and I told him that you were having some service outages in the area. So maybe yeah. that. Yeah, I think that impacts pop, us. Pop back up. All right, so I only have a couple additional questions that we'll ask you, and then we can sort of wrap this up. So okay. let me ask you this. How do you deal with difficult people and difficult conversations as a leader? It really kind of head on uh, and with care. Uh, I, I think that a big piece of leadership is, is a big part of leadership is that you can't afford, you can't avoid conflict. But I do think that, you know, when facing difficult conversations or, or difficult people, you know, you have to do so head on. And so I've, I've 
uh, approached it that way, but, but also with care. You know, you never under, never really know what's going on with other people, so you have to be uh, responsible in how you approach uh, these various conversations or resolving conflict. And if you have an underperformer on your team, what do you do to sort of light a fire under them? Any you know, tactics think, that you Yeah, so I think the first thing that I do is, is really make sure I understand uh, where the challenges are and, and why they're underperforming. And I think we try to do things, whether it be add resources or really just kind of understand, you know, what's what the challenge is. But, you know, I'm pretty, pretty open that I, I have a strong expectation, you know, that folks, uh, you know, perform well. So uh, you've got to meet those expectations. Yeah, and I, I find it, I think it's very important that we share those topics with future leaders because those are the challenging parts of leadership. Like everyone understands things go well, everyone want to heap praise on you. Um, hopefully you're, you know, making sure your team is being lifted up. But yeah. the difficult parts of it is when you got to have those difficult conversations, you got to deal with difficult people, you got to uh, uh, zero in on the folks that aren't performing at the optimal level and figure out how to motivate them to perform at the optimal level. So I like to ask our leaders how to deal with those so that young people can hear that for their leadership journey. Uh, let me ask you this. What advice would you give a college student on leadership? Definitely get as much experience as you can. I think that's that's been one of the areas that I wish I would have would have done earlier. You know, most of the times, you know, folks operate within this box and, and your future is kind of focused on whether you can get outside of that box, you know, whether it be traveling, diverse experience in where you work, uh, even in what you study, but also the relationships that you make. I think you could probably attest to this, you know, the, the people who were cool and successful uh, are considered that in college is very different 15 to 20 years late, you know, so really making sure that you have those, di those diverse relationships and those very diverse experiences allow you to deal with a, a unique group of people and unique circumstances, start circumstances and situations. I think for me, traveling the world, playing basketball, I got exposed to different races and cultures and things that have helped me to really understand and navigate some very difficult uh, personnel challenges in a variety of different places. I, I think you know, that type of experience is nothing I could have gotten on the job. You know, it's just a part of what happens being exposed to uh, different environments. And so for young folks, you know, when you have the ability to go out on a limb and try new things, I, I think folks should do it as much as possible. Would that advice change for say a 30 year old that's a younger professional that has actually embarked on their career journey and uh, they, they want to get some advice on leadership? You know, I don't know if it would if it would change as much, but I think the older you get and the more you get uh, entrenched into your environment, I think we become uh, less risk takers. You know, every, every 10 years you get closer to retirement than you do the beginning of your work experience. And so I don't think that you're ever uh, too old to try something new or embark in a new career, but it will impact the level of leadership along your professional journey. And so I think, you know, the younger you are, the bigger risk I advise people to take because you've got a longer runway. And so I, I think it would change just a little bit for someone that that's, let's say, 10 years ahead in their career, because I think there I would tell them to continue to diversify, but within the, the category of work uh, and professionalism that they're in. Okay. So if someone said they want to be the next Odie Donald, what would you tell him or her to start that trajectory and prepare for the mm -hmm. road ahead? I tell them not to do it. You know, be <laughs> the first you, you know, I, and I mean that, you know, I, I have what I think is the best example 
of an executive leader, you know, that anyone could have in my father. And uh, extremely proud of the legacy that he started and continued through me and my siblings. But I'm not the same type of leader he is. And and outside of being an ethical and 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 a uh, person of integrity, I think the way that I lead and and the focus, whether it be me being in government and him being in the private sector, you know, or even the way we make decisions, you know, I'm the first me. And I, I think that uh, that is something that makes me special and expands on his legacy and allows me to create my own. And so I think the, the biggest thing I would tell people is, you know, don't be afraid to be the unique you and blaze your own path. And so following in my footsteps wouldn't be the right way. It'd be to create your own trail. So we heard about your successes with the city of South Fulton and some of the successes you've had so far in Augusta. Any other major success that you want to share with folks? Oh man, I'm proud. Most, yeah, I'm, listen, if I'm most proud of anything, uh, I'm the father of two amazing children. Uh, you know, Chloe, my oldest, just turned nine. And uh, my namesake, we call him Trip because he's the third. Uh, I think those two accomplishments of being a father, I want to be the father of the year. And so I'm uh, extraordinarily honored and excited to see how successful they are. You know, my son, I think, is developing into a world class soccer player and I think is on his way in basketball as well. And uh, my daughter has appeared in you know, commercials, she's uh, in gymnastics, she's uh, performed, you know, on some fairly large stages as a dancer. And, uh, you know, those two, they're also killing it in school. So the, the number one accomplishment that I'm, I'm proud of is setting an environment for them to kind of figure out who they are and who they want to be. And um, I'm excited about that. And, and definitely, if there's anything that I've been successful in, it's paving a way for them. Have you had any awe-inspiring moments as a leader where you're just like, wow, I can't believe that happened? Uh, the District of Columbia. Uh, that was, that's, that's probably the, the most proud. I, I know, out South Fordston, I mean, it's, it would be one of those two. You know, you look at South Fordston and when I got there, I mean, there was a legacy of just bad decisions. I think they hired the uh, first police chief and fired him within 24 hours. You know, we couldn't get staff members to come and join us. Uh, the budget was a wreck. Uh, we had no facilities. People didn't even think we were going to be able to maintain our charter, which authorized the city. So I'm extremely proud to see South Fords and where it is today as the leader in South Fords and County of all of those communities. But in the District of Columbia, I think is is probably where the impact was made the most. You know, I had a, a budget of about $300 million. Uh, you know, it was rated as one of the worst for economic and workforce development. And at the time that I left, I think it was the best um, public workforce system in the country. Uh, our mayor, who is, I think, one of the best mayors in the country, if not the best, you know, went to reelection, and I'm hoping she decides to go for a third term in the district uh, and, and continue to serve the people there well. We had the lowest unemployment in the history uh, of unemployment on record uh, during that time. Uh, more people got jobs than any time uh, in the history in every single uh, labor law enforcement program that was under my watch set historic numbers. And so to enter into something that was in total disarray and then rise to national prominence and make history, I mean, listen, I often look back on it and I don't even understand how we did it sometimes, but I think that's a testament to, you know, political will and a focus on the people. So I'm just thankful for the residents, you know, for believing in us and allowing us to serve them well. And, and that's probably Again, you know, I'm in all that at one point in time, you know, I, I was jobless, homeless, new father, all of those things. And now I'm able to run governments on behalf of courageous people who put their name on the ballot. So my whole life and career has me at all. And I'm just thankful to uh, God Almighty for 
blessing me with the burden of leadership. So the last question that I have is what would you like your legacy to be as a leader and a person? You know, I, I hope that uh, when people remember me, they remember somebody that served well and uh, and really led not only communities, but, you know, my own family and did so well and created, you know, a, an array of African-American leaders who carried the torch, you know, in a variety of, of communities across the nation, made the world better. You know, if, if I've made my community, my household and, and the world a little bit better, I would uh, I would hope that that's a legacy that um, I could be proud of and that that folks who interacted with me could be proud of as well. All right. Were there any questions from the audience, uh, Miguel? Yes, uh, we had one question that said um, Mr. Donald is no longer involved with the COSF. What candidate advice recommendation would he provide for the city council and citizens regarding moving forward? Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't look back on, you know, I don't think it would probably be appropriate for me to really give any technical advice. I think that uh, you've got a very good group of leaders down there and they have always been focused on hearing from the residents and involving the residents in ensuring what the future of South Fulton looks like. And I don't think there's been much change since I've left, but I'll tell you, the only successes that we had in South Fulton were solely based on hearing from the people and creating a government that involves them and delivers on what the community wants. And I would strongly encourage both the new city manager the current and future members of council and the current and future mayors to never move away from that. I think that, you know, South Fulton is a magical place, but it's magical because it starts with the residents and moving away from that would tear down everything that has been built uh, in the vision of those residents. And so keeping their vision front and center is what I would advise any leaders to do. All right, brother. Well, we have a product of the Atlanta public school system. Yeah, Douglas has been given, high school in the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's been given back to the community as a leader, a professional in government. And uh, we thank you so much for your time today. I think our students, college and high school students and our young professionals will definitely benefit from this discussion. And I thank you for the time, my buddy, my, my good uh, friend. And uh, yeah. this has been great. I you appreciate take you having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Have a good one, sir. All right. All right. Thank you.